Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to be doing this um, analysis exam uh, from, I think, the University of Manchester. So uh, this exam was showcased by the famous, well, you know, fa more famous than, than me in, uh, in math circles at least, um, the YouTuber Tibbies, uh, I forget how her name is exactly pronounced, um, Australian, uh, girl, she does videos on math and physics, and occasionally she, like, showcases exams, so she kind of showcased this. She didn't go through the exam, uh, so that's what I'm gonna be doing here. Now, uh, the allotted time is three hours, and now I think they give some ballpark like 15 16 questions and you only have to answer five um, they're split up into section uh, to parts a and b so I'm assuming you know a is real analysis and b is complex analysis so you have to answer at least two from a and at least two from b so uh, I think my goal is to answer three in a and two in b because I'm a little rusty on complex analysis um, and then we have electric calculators may be used, provided that they cannot store text or transmit receive information slash display graphics. Um, so I'll see if I need that. <laughs> I have a calculator in my desk. Okay, so section A, we have uh, an epsilon delta. Um, okay, I've never really dealt with the left hand side like like a oh well, i guess i could figure out how to do that okay prove okay so i'm assuming by x delta that that's how you deal with infinite limits um okay uh this is uh i don't i don't, I don't think i'm going to be doing that one Okay, um, all right, so for the second question, state the intermediate volume theorem. I know that one. Um, prove that this equation has a solution in zero pi over two. So I'm assuming the way you would do this is uh, move these parts to the left-hand side and then, um, plug in zero, uh, you get two, um, I mean, you know, assuming that you subtract all the sign terms, so you would get two here, or no, three, three here, and then if you plug in pi over two, you're going to get zero plus square root of two minus one minus square root of two, so this is gonna be negative one. So that means that uh, it's going from positive to negative, and obviously this combination of sines and cosines is continuous, so it's gonna have a solution there. And then uh, state carefully rules theorem, so that's like the intermediate value theorem, but for hitting um, a, or it's not, really not the intermediate, it's for the mean value theorem, uh, except that, um, the derivative would be zero. So I can kind of see that because if you take the derivative of the right-hand side, you get, well, you don't exactly get the left-hand side, but I'm assuming that you would use Rolle's theorem to do that. Uh, assume f is differentiable with a local maximum, prove that f prime of c is zero. Okay, so it looks like a2 is something I'd be comfortable with. Uh, prove the product rule. I can do that. Uh, give an example of functions f and g not differentiable at a. Huh. Um. So I wonder if you can do something with like maybe piecewise functions there. Um, I'd have to think about it. 
then calculate the Taylor polynomial t six zero. I'm gonna assume that's the this is the sixth degree polynomial uh, centered at zero. I'm gonna assume that. Okay, so I can do a three uh, to find the upper sum and lower sum. Uh, I can do that. Um, this is a bounded function. Uh, prove this is not Riemann integrable. I believe I can do that. Oh my good lord. Uh, okay, I think I can do that. Uh, okay, so that's... Oh, oh, so there's only four per section. Okay, so I... I think I can do a2 through a4. All right, write down the definition of the partial derivative. Oh my good lord. Um, okay, so prove that. <laughs> um, that is long. Okay, I don't think I want to do that one. Uh, okay, I did this in my complex class. Uh, show that. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Okay, so B6, yeah, I can do that. All right, B7, calculate by I around any point in each of the, jeez. Okay, um, let D, oh, that's gonna be like, I guess, is the natural direction clockwise or counterclockwise? I tend to go counterclockwise in math. Uh, write down the definition of, okay. Recall the course we derived for the expression for a winding number. Okay, I could do that. Stay without proof the generalized code. I don't, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, okay, so my problem here would be these two parts. So it looks like I won't be getting an 100 on this exam per se, but I'm going to do my best. So let's go ahead and copy this and go make a new page. So it's already been eight minutes and I haven't started any work. Um, oops. Okay. Okay, so... Here we go. Alright, so... Let's get started with 1a. So, state carefully the intermediate value theorem. So, if f... Um, I guess I'll, I'll just go from r to r is continuous. Actually, yeah, I'll just go with R to R. Uh, well, OK, I'll say it's defined on R to R, and I'll say it's continuous on some interval A to B. Then for uh, there we 
exists. C in the interval A to B such that um, C, let's see. How do I want to do this? C is in F of A, F of B, or C is in F of B, F of A. Depending on which interval, of course, is defined. Um, I don't really want to deal with the casework. You know, the idea is that C is between F of A and F of B. Okay, so now um, let f of x equal cosine x plus 2 cosine, oh, excuse me, um, minus sine of x minus 2 sine x over 2. Then f of 0 is equal to, as I calculated earlier, it is equal to 3. And f of pi over 2 is, uh, let me double check. So pi over 4, because you want over square root of 2, so that's square root of 2. That's 0. Uh, minus 1. This also gives you square root of 2. So square root of 2 minus square root of 2 gives you minus 1. So since 0 is in the interval minus a, or sorry, minus 1 to 3, there is some c in uh, 0 to pi over 2, such that f of c is equal to 0, namely cosine of c plus 2 cosine c over 2 is equal to sine of c plus 2 sine of c over 2. OK. Now, uh, state carefully rules theorem. So if r to r is differentiable on a to b and um, Now my, okay, whatever. I'm just gonna go with my version of rules theorem, which states that if, uh, if f of a equals f of b, then there is some c in the interval such that f prime of c is equal to zero. Because right, this is just the mean value theorem in the case that it, f of a equals f of b. Okay, so now we need to prove that this has exactly one solution. How are we going to do that? Um, so f of prime of x go to minus sine x minus sine x over 2 minus cosine x minus cosine x over 2. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, um, on zero to pi over two, so my solution has nothing to do with Rolle's theorem, uh, so I'm a little bit confused, but on zero to pi over two, um, sine x, sine x over two, cosine x, and cosine x over two are all non non negative. Actually, better yet, if I put this in open brackets, I can say they are all positive. Thus, f of x is strictly decreasing on 0 to pi over 2. So, um, so f of x equals 0 exactly once. Because right, we showed this solution exists, and uh, that's the only solution because f is strictly decreasing from 3 to minus 1. Um, if there were more than one solution, it would have to uh, increase at some point. Um, or I guess that's how you could argue by, by Rolle's theorem. You could say, if there were more than one solution, then there would have to be a 0 to this at some point. Uh, but that contradicts the fact that it's always negative. Okay, uh, now we have part two of this. Um, assume that f is differentiable on a to b with a local maximum at c. Uh, prove that f prime of c equals zero. So, okay, um, let me sketch out a picture. We have a local maximum at C. What am I allowed to know? This is weird. Um, okay, so I know it's differentiable, so I know it's continuous, and if it has a local, Okay, so for, if I choose some epsilon small enough, I know that f of c minus epsilon is going to be, and f of c plus epsilon are both going to be less than f of c. Uh, So I would have an average rate of change here. Um, uh, 
So for zero less than epsilon less than the minimum of um, B minus C and A minus C. So just to guarantee that um, my points are going to be in the interval still. Um, uh, sufficiently sufficiently small. Uh, f of c minus epsilon is less than f of c, uh, which is greater than f of c plus epsilon. Um, then there is some d minus in uh, c minus epsilon to c and d plus in c to c plus epsilon such that f prime of d minus is equal to f of c minus f of c minus minus epsilon all over epsilon which is going to be greater than zero and f prime of d plus is going to be f of c plus epsilon minus f of c over epsilon which is less than zero um, then since f of x, f prime of x is continuous, there is some d in, um, d minus to d plus with um, f prime of d equal to zero. Uh, but um, d is in c minus epsilon and to c plus epsilon. So as epsilon goes to zero, you must have f prime of c equal to zero. So I'm not sure if I'm missing some simpler argument here, but uh, <laughs> that's the way I would go about it. Um, OK, so I think that that finishes A2. Um, Okay, so now we're on to A3, which is derivatives and Taylor polynomial. Okay, and this exam is tough. All right, all right, so suppose F and G are differentiable at A, prove the product rule. Okay, so um, FG prime of A is the limit as h approaches 0 of f g of a plus h minus f g of a all over h. And the trick for the product rule is to um, uh, add and subtract Like this is f of a plus h times g of a plus h. So you want to do like f of a plus h times g of a plus f of a plus h g of a minus fg. <laughs> Running out of space. 
Uh, so essentially you add and subtract this term, and then uh, what this allows you to do is factor uh, the two expressions. So you get f of a plus h um, times g times a, or g of a plus h minus g of a, um, all over h plus limit as h approaches 0 of, and then you factor on this side, you get g of a times f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. And so we split the limit up over uh, this addition sign here, we factored. Um, and so we see that here we can take a product of limits. This limit of f of a plus h is going to go to f of a. And then this limit is, by definition, g prime of a. So this is f of a, g prime of a, plus g of a, f prime of a. And that's the standard. That's the standard proof. OK, so now we have to give an example of functions which are not differentiable at a, but which for which the product is differentiable at a. Uh, so again, my best guess is to give a um, like a piecewise function, like let f and g be the same function x my absolute value of x minus a. Um, so this function, these functions, which are the same function, is differentiable everywhere except a. And f g, the product, is x minus a squared, which is a smooth function. Uh, and, and so this, this suffices as an example, right? Uh, so if you just look at the, the graph, um, so like say here's a, so you have the absolute value, they're both f and g are the absolute value, and then it becomes um, a parabola, which is differentiable at this point. Okay? Um, so I mean, it just says give an example, so I'm assuming you can just give the most trivial example. Okay, now we need to calculate this Taylor polynomial. Now I'm not uh, familiar with this notation that they give. So what I'm going to assume is that this is the um, uh, and my mind's all out of the place today. The 6 degree polynomial centered at 0. So I think there's two ways to approach this. Uh, one way would to be just straight up take derivatives of this function. Um, which is going to be pretty simple because you're going to have this e to the x factor that's always going to, it's not going to be changed when, when you, um, like when you product rule, it's not going to be changed uh, if it's being differentiated or not. And so you just have e to, e to the x times something, and then you're going to have cosines and sines, and you just plug in. Another way you can do it, uh, which is how I'm going to attempt to do it, is to um, take the Taylor series for e to the x and cosine of x individually and multiply them as polynomials and then just lob off the extra terms, right? So that's what I'm going to do instead of taking a bunch of derivatives i'm just going to do this okay so e to the x obviously is going to have the most terms and then cosine of x will only have half of those with some pluses and minuses right um, okay, I need a tissue, hold on. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So, 
I'm thinking that something might happen with these alternating signs and the same things showing up. Actually, I'm not sure. I might just have to multiply this all out and see what happens. All right, so we're just going to go term for term. So I'm going to start with this 1. We get 1 minus x squared over 2 plus x to the 4th over 24 minus x to the 6th over 720, so that's the 1. The x, you get plus x minus x cubed over 2 plus x to the 5th over 24. Now we don't get this uh, x to the 6th. Um, this gets bumped up to x to the 7th, but we're just looking at the 6th degree polynomial. Then we get x squared over 2 um, minus x to the 4th over 4. Oh my god. The worst part about this is going to be adding fractions. <laughs> uh, all right, and then we get x cubed over 6 minus x to the 5th over 12. Um, and then we get x to the 4th over 24 minus x to the 6th over 48. Then we get plus x to the 5th over 120. And then we get plus x to the 6th over 720. Okay, so um, obviously the only one term we have, the only constant term is 1. And that matches up with what we would expect if we plug in x equals 0. Uh, now we have an x term. We should only get one x term. Yeah. So that means the first derivative would be 1, which matches up with my mental calculation. Okay, so now we have some x squared terms. We have minus x squared over 2 and plus x squared over 2, and those should be the only x squared terms. So there's no x squared term. Now we have minus x cubed over 2 plus x cubed over 3. Uh, so let me scratch these out, and I'm going to scratch out the ones that I've already written as well. Okay, so we have minus x cubed over 2 plus x cubed over 6. So that's going to be, please let me do this right, minus x cubed over 3. I'm going to double check that like three times mentally. I swear, I I hate doing... Okay, I, I believe that's correct. Um, it's not people are going to be laughing in my comment sections. All right. Um, now with x to the 4, we have x to the 4th. Uh, we have 2x to the 4th over 24, so that's x to the 4th over 12. Minus x to the 4th over 4, so that's 3. So we have minus 2, so minus x to the 4th over 6. Okay, so let me get rid of the x to the 4th now. Okay, uh, now I think uh, these x to the 6 cancel out. Um, and so do these. Yeah, so there's no x to the 6th term, actually. Um, now x to the 5th, we have plus 24 minus 12, so that's going to be minus 24. And then plus 120, so that's minus 5, so that's minus x to the 5th over 30. So I believe that is the correct answer. Um, if it's not, um, oh well. Uh, I guess I could... No, I'm not, I don't even feel like checking it with like a little sample calculation. So is that it for this problem? Yeah, that was it. Okay. So far, so good. Um, about 30 minutes in. Okay, so now we have the Riemann integral question. Yeah, so I have to zoom out to screenshot this because it's so much. Okay. So obviously I <laughs> don't even have room. Oh, okay. Um, all right. 
So for one, what do we have? We have f is a bounded function. Okay, so the idea here is that the bounded function allows us to take um, uh, supremes and, um, or not even supremes, but maximums and minimums. Uh, actually, it's not guaranteed that it's continuous. So does it achieve? No, it doesn't achieve. So I have to take supreme, supremums, but they will exist because it's bounded. So the upper sums are going to be when you take on each sub interval you take the supremum of f on that interval and and then the lower sums are going to be when you take the infimum so uh, so we have u of p f is going to be the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of, or really I'm just going to say capital M sub i delta x sub i, where uh, delta x sub i equals x sub i plus 1 minus x sub i. And m sub i is the supremum uh, x is between these two values of f of x. And then I'll add in a sentence which exists since f is bounded. Okay. Uh, and then you have the lower, lower sum. So I have uh, videos on, on these. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. Um, this isn't even something I, I've, I've like studied in school. I kind of, I kind of cheated past uh, real analysis. So I kind of taught it to myself and taught it uh, to YouTube at the same time. Okay, so I've already defined what delta x i is, and then uh, m sub i is going to be the infimum on each subinterval. Okay. Okie doke. Um, so now for two. So for two, we have uh, the, I know this function has a name. Um, the function, which is one, it's like the ident um, the indicator function of the rationals. So it's one when x is rational and zero when x is irrational. So if you imagine graphing it, it's obviously just going to be a mess because the rationals are dense and are. Um, so prove that h is not Riemann integrable over 0, 1. So uh, I guess let p be a partition 0 to xn. Um, Uh, so the idea is that um, since Q is dense in R, there always exists both a, uh, well, there always exists a rational number in, uh, in 
the interval x sub i to x sub i plus 1. Um, the irrationals are also dense. So that there is always an irrational in x sub i, x sub i plus 1. Thus, the upper sum of f, right, on any interval, you will always uh, be obtaining the value of 1. Uh, so all the m sub i's, capital M sub i's, are equal to 1, and then you just have a sum of delta x i, which telescopes do become, uh, you know, x sub n minus x sub 0, which is 1 minus 0, which is 1. And uh, by a similar argument, for the lower sums, all the little m sub i's are all 0, because you're always going to have irrational numbers, which correspond to a value of 0, so you just have a sum of zeros, which is 0. Um, thus, uh, no matter the partition, um, you and the upper and lower sums do not get arbitrarily close. And so um, h of x is, oh, I just realized I've been writing f is not integrable by the Darbo criterion. Right, so I have videos on the Darbo criterion, uh, which is essentially just this alternate idea of Riemann sums using upper and lower sums. Okay, okay so I'm going to copy this part over to the next page. Okay, so we have a partition that is going from 1 to 4. OK, so what is our function? So our function is x squared minus 1. Okay, so let's get a plot of this going. OK, so f is increasing right, from 0 to 15, right? So some, <laughs> uh, some, some point, right? So 4, 15, OK? Um, so, but, but it's always increasing on this interval, so that means the upper sums are going to correspond to um, always taking the uh, higher of two values, right? So um, u of p sub n and f is going to be equal to sum as i goes from 0 to n of f of 1 plus 3i over n, and then the delta is going to be 3i over n, right? So normally, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, is this, sorry, I think, I think I have this backwards, wait, do I? It's so like on the first interval, you're going from 1 to 1 plus 4 over n. So that's i equals 0. So you want to do, I don't know, I see. Uh, OK, I'm going to do it like this. And I think this works. Sorry, not 3. Yeah, 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 so this works. Now, 
Wait, you're gonna get I cubed in there. And I know how to summon. Am I doing this right? All right, let's hope I'm doing this right. I mean, I guess I'll know, right? So this gives us something in. Okay, so uh, we plug x this into x squared minus 1. So when this squares, we're going to have a 1 that cancels. And then we get 6i over n. Um plus n i squared over n. This is all 3. Uh, that's an n squared. This is all 3i over n. OK, so we have actually 18 over n squared. Sum from as i equals go, i goes from 1 to n. i squared plus 27 over n cubed. 1 to n of i cubed. Yes, yeah, so that's why I'm confused why they give us these formulas, but uh, it turns out that the i cubed one is actually just the square of this one. Um, anyway, this is 18 over n squared times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6 plus 27 over n cubed. I hope this this doesn't look good. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, that that's why. Okay, sorry. Uh, the 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 dx here is just three over n. Okay, that that makes me a lot happier. Okay. All right. So this is n times n plus 1 over 2. And this is 27 over n cubed. Yeah, because I was like, this value shouldn't, like, it shouldn't be growing with n. That would be bad. Uh, this is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. How's my time doing? Okay. I think I'm doing fine on time. Uh, over 6, okay. And so we do some minor simplifications. So yeah, we're going to have the n squared. So I'm going to keep the n squared. And what, we get the 2, yeah, we get the 2n squared. So I'm going to keep the, the 2n squared here. So we get 18 uh, n plus 1, well... Let's do it like this. n plus 1 times, so a th we get a, a 3 cancels, and this comes a 9. So I'm going to pull out a 9n plus 1. And so then you get 2n plus, pulled an n, cancel an n here, plus 2n plus 1, all over 2n squared which is equal to 9 times n plus 1 times 4n plus 1 all over 2n squared. And that is good. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mess it up. Uh, so this is a. I should have denoted that. Okay, so now find a similar result for L. So the lower sums, right, since P is increasing, or sorry, since F is increasing, the lower sum is going to correspond to taking essentially, I don't want to do this. Uh, I still want to do I, I goes from 1 to n, but now no, it's, it's going to be messy. I'm just going to do it like this f of i, I'm sorry, 1 plus 3i over n, uh, 3 over n. And so again, we do um, 
f of x squared minus 1. So this becomes... Uh, really, these are this is going to become the same formula, right? Yeah. So let me cut the chase, and we get 18 over n squared. I goes from 1 to n minus 1. So notice that um, since the 0 won't contribute anything, um, f of x will equal 0 there. So I'm dropping the i equals 0. And, uh, and then when I'm just going to plug n minus 1 into the formulas. So we get i here, and then we get i equals 1 to n i squared n minus 1 here. And so this is 18 over n squared times n times n minus 1 over 2 plus 27 over n cubed times n minus 1 times n times 2n minus 1 over 6. Now I'm going to assume that we do the same um, kind of cancellations. So we do 1 over 2n squared, and then 9 times n minus 1, and then we get 2n plus 2n minus 1. And so this equals 9 times n minus 1 times 4n minus 1 all over uh, 2n squared. Okay. okay, prove by verifying the definition that f is integrable over f 1 to 4 and find the value of the integrable, integral. So, uh, since um, The limit and approaches infinity of u of p sub n and f equals the limit uh, And so this limit is equal to, let's see, 9 times 4 over 2, so that's 18. Let's do a quick check, quick sanity check, that if I integrate x squared minus 1 dx from 1 to 4, I'm going to get x cubed over 3 minus x from 1 to 4. You get uh, 21 minus 3, which is 18. Awesome. Um, Uh, and f is continuous on a closed interval. It follows that the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx exists and equals 18, right? So cont continuity on a closed interval guarantees that the function's Riemann integral. And then um, since the Riemann integral will be always in between the upper and lower sums, if they are limiting to the same value, then by the squeeze theorem, uh, the Riemann integral must be equal to 18. Okay, so that concludes section A, and I'm done within an hour, so uh, I guess that's pretty good timing. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back over these problems. I, I definitely, they, there's just so much here, like a converse, like I'm sure, I, mean, I don't even, ugh. Okay. I know I can do this one. This one's going to be fun. So we're, we're just going to start with this one. Okay, so I just need to do two more. Uh, so, so one after this. Okay, so I'm going to snag this. 
and we're gonna tackle it. All right, so. Okay, so we want to show that um, using sine of z equals e to the i z minus e to the i z, um, or minus e to the minus i z all over 2i. If z equals x plus i y, then um, sine of z equals this, right? So uh, I'm assuming that x and y are uh, real values, okay? So, so we have sine z is going to be equal to e to the i x plus i y minus e to the i minus i x minus or x plus i y all over 2i okay so this is going to be e to the minus y times e to the i x minus e to the y e to the minus i x all over 2i. Okay, so... So I think the goal here is uh, obviously e to the minus y and e to the y are real numbers now because um, uh, well, because e and y are real, and um, well, I guess that doesn't verify, but but e to the y is always real. So for for y being real, so I think what I can do is replace e to the i x by cosine x plus i sine x, and then e to the minus x by cosine x minus i sine x. And then separate everything into real and imaginary parts, and then I'll have like a sine x factor and a cosine factor, and then I'll get the, um, you know, the hyperbolic expression here. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to write this as e to the minus y cosine x plus i sine x minus e to the y cosine x minus i sine x over 2i, which is going to be equal to um, so I'm going to separate everything in terms of real e to the y. So I guess I'll cosine x all over 2i uh, plus i sine x plus i sine x i sine x e to the minus i y or sorry e to the minus y plus e to the y all over 2i right so what happens here is this becomes the real part and then this is going to become the imaginary part because this is minus i here. So we have sine x e to the minus y plus e to the y over 2, which we can recognize as hyperbolic cosine. Um, plus, I'm going to move this minus into here. So you have plus cosine x, uh, i cosine x times e to the y minus e to the minus y all over 2. And so we can uh, recognize these as the formulas for hyperbolic sine and cosine. So this is sine x hyperbolic cosine plus i cosine hyperbolic sine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, two. All right. So, write this down. Show that the solutions to sine z equals zero are precisely z equals k pi. Um. Okay. So what we have is we have sine z is equal to 
I'm just going to jot, jot this down. It's I cos x hyperbolic sine of x 0. So this implies two equations. This implies sine x cosine hyperbolic x. Uh, sorry, sorry. This is y and this is y. Right? Does that match the? Yeah. Okay. This is y and this is y. Okay. So this gives us two equations because remember zero is like zero plus zero i. So we get two equations that are now in real variables. Um, so the hyperbolic cosine is never equal to zero. So this implies that sine of x is equal to zero, which implies that x is equal to k pi for k being an integer. And um, that's what we know from, from the real number properties of sine of x. Now, the hyperbolic sine of y, um, well, now, so since, so sine of x equal to zero, right, implies that uh, cosine x, absolute value, is one, which implies that if this product is to be zero, uh, this means that this hyperbolic sine has to be zero, right? Because if I have plus or minus one, times something equals zero, this has to be zero. But the, the hyperbolic sine is zero if and only if y is zero, or the, the input variable is zero, right? Because hyperbolic sine kind of looks like this, kind of looks like a cubic. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, thus, z, which is equal to x plus i y, is equal to k pi plus i zero, which is equal to k pi, and k is in z. Okay, so that gives two. Um, show that the periods of, okay. So for three, we want to show the periods. Okay, so we want to show that if sine of z plus p plus sine of z, uh, So they give us the addition formula for sine. Oh, okay. Um, so if we use this expansion, we get sine z cosine p, and the period is, okay, yeah, wait. Sorry, I keep scrolling. Okay, yeah, periods can be complex. Um, plus cosine z sine p. Okay. And so this equation holds for all z. So let's look at, like, say sine, um, so like z equals zero. Uh, so z equals zero implies that 0 equals 0 plus sine p. Uh, so if sine p equals 0, OK. So it can be, um, you know, plus or minus, uh, what should we call it? Um, sorry, brain farting. Whatever. Uh, so, so it could be integer multiples of pi, but we need to show it's double integer, even integer multiples of pi. Uh, and to do that, I believe we can plug in z equals pi over 2, and that gives 1 is equal to cosine p plus 0. And so cosine p is equal to 1, which happens... Or really, I think I could have gone without 
plugging in z equals 0, just plugging in z equals pi over 2 gives us that um, 1 equals cosine of p, and that's uh, sufficient for p equaling um, 2k pi for k and z. And uh, let me think a little bit more about this. Conversely, um, cos. So we know that the um, Sorry, I just have to think again. Yeah, so we already know this tells us that p is an integer multiple of pi. Uh, so it's our, we already know from this that p has to be a real number. Right? The only solutions to sine equals 0 are real numbers. And so that means that when we get to cosine p equals 1, we know that we're looking at multiples of pi, but it alternates between um, 1, and, uh, 1 and minus 1. It's 1 only with the even multiples. And then we can say, conversely, cosine of 2k pi equals 1 sine of 2k pi equals 0. So sine of z plus 2k pi. This is just showing that it actually um, is indeed a period. Yeah. Now we need to find the, um, the periods of the exponential function, and then we have to solve an equation. So, um, so part three continued. The periods of exp z, so exp of z plus p is equal to exp z plus exp p. So if you're not familiar with this notation, this just means e to the z. It's just sort of an inline expression. Um, so here we've used that. If you have an addition in the exponential, this becomes a product of the exponentials. So if p is to be a period, this means that this equals exp z for all z. Now we know that exp of z is not equal to 0, so, um, so exp of p is equal to 1, okay, if p is equal to x plus i y, then x of p is going to be e to the x times cosine y plus i sine y, which is equal to 1. So this means we have two equations, e to the x cosine y equals 1, and e to the x sine y is equal to 0. Um, e, now e to the x is not equal to 0, so sine y is equal to 0, um, thus... Um, now it's cosine y equal to plus or minus 1. But since we're dealing with, uh, so x and y are in the real numbers here, with the real numbers, e to the x, e to the x is greater than 0. So, um, so cosine of y equals 1. Thus, um, y is equal to 2 pi, or 2k pi 
Um, yeah, 2k pi for k and z. Now e to the x equals 1, and the only real solution is x equals 0. Thus, p, which we said was x plus iy, is equal to 0 plus 2k pi i, which is equal to 2k pi i, or k in the integers. Okay. All right. For we want to solve e to the z equals e to the i z. Uh, okay. So let me brainstorm some ideas. So one idea I have is to say z equals x plus i y, and then get x equations in terms of x and y. Another idea I have is to divide divide by z um, actually it might be better just to divide by z so since e to the z is never zero we have that 1 is equal to i times, um, or sorry, z times i minus 1. Okay, so um, if z equals x plus i, y, uh, then we get where x and y, of course, are in the real numbers. Uh, 1 is e. I'm just going to write it in line. So z, you have minus x minus y plus i times x minus y. which is equal to x of minus x minus y, x of i times x minus y. Um, thus, since e to the i r magnitude is equal to 1 for r in the real numbers, and e to the r is greater than 0 for r in the real numbers, we have, if we take the magnitude on both sides, this shows us that x of minus x minus y is equal to 0, or sorry, equal to 1. So um, x plus y is equal to 0, or y equals minus x. Then 1 is equal to x of i uh, 2ix, which is equal to cosine of 2x plus i sine 2x, which implies that 1 is equal to the cosine of 2x and 0 is equal to the sine of 2x, uh, which implies uh, 2x is equal to an even integer multiple of pi, which implies x is an integer multiple of pi for k and, zero, uh, k and z. So z is equal to... Um, k pi times i minus 1, k is in z. Alrighty. 
All right, uh, an hour 15, okay. Um, we have one question left. So I think I decided I was gonna do this one. Now, I don't think I'm gonna get all of these, but I'm just gonna paste parts of these at a time because I know I'm not gonna have the, the space to work with all of this. Okay. All right, consider calculate by i. Okay, so for a, right, so let's say we have a point here. Okay, so let's say that this counterclockwise direction is positive. Okay, so we go. All right, so we loop around only once. Now for B, uh, let's say, uh, let's say we take this point, okay? So we wrap around. I think that counts as two. Uh, let me let me kind of think about this. Yeah, yeah, that counts as two. Okay, so the winding number, if you don't know, is essentially you take a point and you kind of trace the graph and you count how many times you go around the point. Okay, so here's one, there's two, and then there's three. Now D, you're gonna get some, some cancellation. Okay, so you go, There you get negative one. Well, yeah, yeah, you get negative one there. So I think that has a winding number of zero because you get this minus one here and then the, the one from the total loop. So I think that's zero. I, I'm a little shoddy on that. People can correct me. Uh, let D be a domain, and let D F be a continuous. Let you know, write down. The, okay, so the definition. This is the uh, line integral. Is the integral from over A to B of F of gamma of T dt. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's just it, right? So you have, uh, this is a real variable, right? This is an interval. You don't have intervals in the complex plane. So you have a real variable parametrizing some curve in a complex domain, and then you're calculating the line integral of a function. Yeah, so that, that should be it. Um, okay, <laughs> so far so good. Um, so I'll go ahead and paste this. All right, recall that we derived the expression for the winding number uh, with this integral. So let, oh yeah, so there's this figure. This figure. So I'll paste that, and then I kind of only need, like, it partially. Well,
So Gamma 2, it looks like, wraps around twice. Okay, so yeah, Gamma 2 is going to be for like the next problem. Okay, so... Let D describe once anti-clockwise down a parameterization for gamma 1. So uh, let's say, oh, I did not mean to do that. All right, gamma 1 of T. So I'm going to parameterize this over uh, 0 to 2 pi, of course. This is going to be... Um, 2 plus 3i plus 2e to the iz. Yeah, that works. Um, and this is a trick in general for parameterizing circles in the complex plane. You just take the center plus radius times e to the iz, which we know is going to go around, um, sorry, e to the it, my, my fault, uh, e to the it, because for real parameters, this traces the unit circle, so then if you multiply by the radius, that's radius r circle, and then you shift by the center. Um, ah, you know what? Uh, I was wrong here. You have to multiply by gamma prime of t dt. Um, okay. All right. So, okay. So using this, we get one over two pi i. So I should expect the answer of one. So we go from zero to two pi dz. So z is going to be gamma of t. So that's where we get gamma prime. Gamma prime is going to be uh, 2i e to the i t dt over z minus z0. See, this is convenient because z0 is our center. So uh, if we subtract off, we just get 2e to the i t. And so this gives us 2 pi i. Uh, so we have 2 pi i over 2 pi i, which is 1. And that's a that's what we expected. So that's good. So that tells me I was doing this right, that, that it's the anti-clockwise. Um, perfect. All right. Um, love when exams reaffirm you. All right. State without proof. Now, I don't know that. I do not. Generalized Cauchy. So, okay, so let's see if I can think.
I know I can figure it out. I just have to think about it. So the contour gamma two. Let me pull the uh, yeah. So this is. Let me get the picture back over here. Right, so the contour gamma two is um, going around the point twice, which means the winding number is double. So that almost that wants me that makes me want to say on a whim that this integral. Uh, see, I know, I know it has something to do with when you have a a point singularity, which is what you have here. You have a point singularity. Generalized Cauchy. Wait, does this have to do with residues, though? It might have to do with residues. So if gamma contains... So, so like, we know... Okay, we know something like this. It's going to give you the winding number of gamma and z naught. Okay, we know that. No, or you know, times two pi i. And that's the singularity. This function, right, is holomorphic on the whole domain except for z, z naught, right? And this 2 pi i is... the residue. think I, I I think it's this but oh uh... So I think this is the generalized Cauchy theorem. Obviously with, with this, you know, D, blah, blah, blah. So this tells us that if the integral gamma 1 over gamma 1 of F is equal to 1 plus i. This is equal to, we know the winding number is 1 times 2 pi i times whatever this residue is at z naught. And therefore, if we take the integral over gamma 2, this is going to be 2 times 2 pi i times the residue. 
at z0. And that's just 2 times 1 plus i, which is 2 plus 2i. Now, I don't exactly know if this is the generalized Cauchy theorem, but I think it is. And, and you know, I'm, I'm leaving out some words, right? f has to satisfy that it's holomorphic everywhere except for a point, that point being z0. Of course, z0 is 2 plus 3i in this case. So I think that's that's what's happening here. So yeah, I think that's it. So a, an hour and a half, so that's like half the time allotted. Uh, so I feel pretty good about that. And of course, the first eight minutes were me looking at the test, uh, just like discussing the problems. So yeah, I think this was a pretty pretty good uh, pretty good exam. Uh, if you made it to the end of this video, I applaud you for <laughs> sitting through me taking an exam. Um, and I uh, hope you watch my other videos. Yeah, bye.